Welcome to Footnote. I'm your host, Maggie LaMonica, and today we're privileged to have with us the author, Dr. Jill Carroll. She's written a book called A Dialogue of Civilizations. And this powerful book takes us on a journey into the level of resonance between Islam and the West. In her book, Dr. Carroll discusses the ideas of Fatula Gulen, an influential Turkish intellectual and scholar of Islam, and finds echo in the context of larger humanity. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Thank you, Maggie. Jill I'm glad Carroll. to be here. Tell us about your background and what inspired you to write this fabulous book. Well, um, background's a long story. We could do a long show on that. But in terms of my scholarly background, I mean, that's really what inspires me to write. I am a specialist in uh, religion, in the religious studies. Um, I have a PhD in that. I'm a college professor. And when I first encountered the ideas of Fethullah Gulen, I was immediately impressed and blown away by the kind of connections that I saw in his work and some of the other work that I've done and was familiar with just from being a scholar in the humanities. And so that really was the beginning thing, the germ that inspired me to write the book. Okay. Tell us a little bit about Goulin and, and, and his, his philosophy and how this all kind of started to come together in a cohesive form. Yeah. Um, I, I learned about Goulin, not, actually not from reading his work at all but from visiting Turkey in December of 2004, I was part of an interfaith trip of people from the Houston, Texas area and maybe a few people from Oklahoma and others. And we were on a trip for about 10 days. We went to Turkey and um, we visited all over Turkey, but we visited these schools and hospitals and things. And I learned later that they are all run by people who are inspired by Mr. Gulen's ideas. And so I thought, who is this person? And so I, when I got back, I began to do my research and I discovered this whole career, this, this man and this whole career of his as a, as a scholar and as an imam, as a preacher in Turkey and this whole body of work. And so I began to do this work and, and read his work and was very impressed with his ideas. He's a classically trained Islamic scholar coming from the Sunni tradition, which is the largest uh, body in Islam. And uh, it, it's very powerful stuff. You met him. I did meet him. I was very fortunate and honored to meet him about a year ago. And, and you had a couple of, of interactions. I did, with yeah. Him. It was uh, actually it was September of 2006 when I met him. And he, uh, I, the group I was with, a small group, we flew in and, and went to visit him. And he was very gracious with us. He, stayed up late because our plane was late and it was storming and it took us several hours longer to get to him than we thought and he was very gracious and stayed up uh, and waited for us to come so we could eat dinner together and then he uh, we had a breakfast with him the next morning and i was very honored to meet him and when i when i did meet him i knew um, i could feel th that i was with someone very special he has a very calming spirit and and he's funny. He's got a sense of humor, which is always nice. It reminded me of the Dalai Lama, because the Dalai Lama is a very calming, peaceful person, and he's also very funny. So, oh, I think laughter is, is calming. It is calming, and it means you don't, you, you, the, the Chinese have an interesting saying. They say, uh, the master is someone who takes serious things lightly and light things seriously. There's a kind of paradox there, and I, I found that in Mr. Gulen. Yes, that's, uh, that's amazing, but I, I think it, it is true. We have just because people are very educated doesn't mean they can't be funny. That's absolutely right. And just because it's a serious topic doesn't mean you have to be somber about it. Right. Why does this movement deserve so much attention? Do you think? I, I think mean, it deserves attention for a couple of reasons. For one, it is faith inspired, but it's not faith based. And what I mean, and that's an interesting thing. What I mean What's by the that, difference? yeah. What I mean by that is that. The people who are involved in it and who teach in the schools and work in the hospitals and do the various initiatives, all the different cultural and business and economic initiatives, they mostly are people of faith who are contributing themselves and their resources as a part of their faith. So it's faith-based um, for them, but it's, um, it's faith inspired by them, but it's not limited to people of faith. It's for everyone. And it's not about converting anyone to a particular faith. In this case, it's Islam. 
It's not about trying to make the world Islam. It's just about trying to make the world a better place, a place of respect and tolerance, and to educate people to be people of conscience, to think about virtue and to develop virtues in themselves, and to be people of virtue in their community. So while it is sort of faith inspired on the part of the individuals, it's not a faith-based platform. It's a transnational civil society movement. It's not a, a faith movement. It's not about really converting. It's not, well, it's not about converting anybody at all. So it's just very broad. So that's, I think that's very notable because that's a very interesting combination. Second thing is, is that it's very large. Um, some estimates say there are something like a thousand schools uh, in operation right now throughout tr throughout the world, actually. And he, Mr. Gulen has now inspired three generations of people in Turkey. So it's beginning to have critical mass now. And this is important, though, too, again, that part of the re reason when you say faith-inspired, not faith-based, part of the big problem in the world today is that people say, well, if you're not doing what I'm doing, then you're wrong. That doesn't, we can all be different and still united on one front as far as humanity. Absolutely. That's yeah, because key. exactly it's it's central because we can have connection because we have common concerns. We all have concerns about having a peaceful society so that we can live our lives and be happy. We all have concerns about educating our children to be the the adults that they are meant to be and to come into their perfection. We all have ideas about how to make our society safe. And, and productive and, and communal. These are common human concerns of people everywhere. 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 No matter who you are, no matter where you're from. Exactly. You and I were talking earlier about we have some similarities yeah, in, our, yeah. in our past, but, but no matter what continent you're on, we all have the same, we all have feelings. That's right. We all want, That's we right. all want the same things. And at the same time that we have those concerns, you know, there are differences. And we are different. But those things don't have to be a barrier to relationship. We don't have to be afraid of our differences. We can unite on those. And, and you, you say in your book that, that people are very scared of getting out of their comfort zone mm -hmm. if something's not, and it's, if it's unfamiliar to them, then they just shut it out. So let's talk about that a little bit and how frightening that is. I think it's a human tendency. Um, and I don't necessarily think that it's bad, that we, we tend to gravitate toward things that are like us and toward people that are like us and, and toward people who think the way we do because that feels comfortable and familiar. Um, if it's, say, something we grew up in, I mean, the deep grooves of our consciousness are, are made in that context. So I don't think it's wrong of us that we tend to gravitate toward things that are similar. However, we don't live in a world where everyone's the same. We live in a world where everyone is different. We pray to different gods. We have different lifestyles. We have different worldviews about life and the world and reality and what we're supposed to do here and how we're supposed to be. And we don't have the option anymore of just isolating off from people who are different from us, especially in a country like the United States, where we've got all the world's religions alive and well here, all kinds of people, atheists, secular people, religious people, all sorts of uh, different ethnic and racial communities. This is an immigrant nation. We don't have the luxury of just being with people that are the same with us. So it challenges us. This kind of diversity challenges us to step out of our comfort zones. And that can be uncomfortable, but we still have to do it. I, I, like, I have a little saying that I like. It says, if you're not feeling the stretch, you're not doing the work. It's kind of like yoga, you know? It's like, <laughs> you need to feel that stretch and feel that little bit of discomfort and then come to be okay with that. And it might be discomfort in the beginning, but again, then it's also so enlightening and it's really, really special to kind of get out of your comfort zone. And, and again, we go back to that thing that even though it's different at the at core, we're all really very, very similar. Yeah, we're very much the same. And it can be empowering when we step out and we take the risk, step out, connect with someone who's different and then see that it actually can be okay then it's like, okay, well, good. I can be empowered in this situation. I don't have to be afraid or freaked out or scared that people are different. I can just be with that and just learn that, that actually we can find connection even though we're very different. We can always find a human connection. Yeah. Yes, we're humans. A, we can find a human and connection. And we need to act like it. <laughs> uh, you, 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 in your book, you group him with several other really notable. Mm. Big humans, time notables. Big time notables. How'd you, yeah. Go down that path. I put him with the greats because in my career as a college professor, I've taught these people for 20 years. The great people of, of world thought, not just the West, but world thought. Confucius from China, Plato, um, which is also Socrates, they're together there. 
Immanuel Kant, great enlightenment philosopher. John Paul Sartre, French uh, atheist existentialist. John Stuart Mill, British uh, social theorist. And these are people, along with scads of others, that I've spent my career teaching in the college, in colleges and universities. And I love their ideas. I, I love philosophy. I love world philosophy, looking at how different um, philosophers from around the world and thinkers and scholars attack the questions that, that, that are central to what it means to be a human. You know, How did we get here? Who are we? What are we supposed to do now that we're here? How are we supposed to live? How do we deal with death? What are we supposed to give ourselves to? How do you define the good? How, how do you raise up people? How should we become the people we're supposed to be? And so these are the ideas that I love about world philosophy. And when I read Mr. Gulen, I see that he's concerned with those exact same ideas as that I've been, that I've been spending my time with and my career with for 20 years. So, some people say, well, are you saying that Gulen is as great as Plato? I mean, these are the big names of world philosophy. And I said, well, I'm not saying that or not saying it. That's not really the point. I wanted to bring Islam into this conversation. And Mr. Gulen is such an eloquent spokesperson and scholar in Islam. I thought, well, let's use him and bring him into this world conversation. Yes, and it's not about comparing him to them. No. He has a lot of the similar philosophies. That's, I think, yes. the central theme That's is the point. Is the point is that they, points all of these residence. great thinkers, regardless of what they, the minimal issues, they, they all have feel the same. Yeah, on some I mean, level. They, on, on certain issues, they on are absolutely issues. in connection with each other. Tell us about there, there are five major themes, dialogue themes mm -hmm. in your book. And, uh, uh, you know, and we start with inherent human value. Let's talk right. about those and how and how you came to that. These themes are the ones that, you know, the, uh, Maggie, the thing about writing a book is that you get to write what you love because it's your book and you get to write it. And uh, I, I picked these themes for a lot of reasons, one of which is that they're themes that I love. I, I'm obsessed with these themes. And so I picked them. But I also think that as a set of five themes, they hang together really powerfully. And so I start by putting Mr. Gulen and Immanuel Kant into a dialogue around this issue of inherent human dignity and moral worth. Because for myself, I think that if we are to have a workable world society that's good for people, that's good for everyone, where everyone can feel as safe as we can feel, then you have to begin with that commitment, the commitment that says every human being has inherent worth, every human being not just beings that look like me or that think like me or are from the same part of the world as I am. Every human being has inherent moral worth. And to me, that, sound, that seems like a, a groundbreaking thing, like the basis of if we're gonna have a peaceful society in a global sense. So I thought that was the most important thing to start with. And then that transitions to the next chapter, which is Mr. Gulen in conversation with uh, British theorist John Stuart Mill on the notion of freedom. And so that's unpacking this notion of, you know, once we've uh, acknowledged that human beings have inherent worth, what is, uh, there are many things that make human beings special, but what is the one thing that if it's hampered, it minimizes our human potential? And it's freedom, freedom of thought, freedom to think, to inquire, to, to think about our experiences, to reflect on them. This is how we have wisdom. We don't have wisdom without freedom to think. And, and to, I mean, we'll have experiences, but if we don't have the freedom to talk about them with other people, to join together with others and discuss them and to process them and to write about them and, and express those to the larger community and have a discussion, this is what it means to be human. And so freedom of thought seemed very central there. And I think that we can see even historically that in societies or com political structures that clamp down heavily on freedom of thought, that's a dying society. It may live for a short time because of the strength of the muscles and the weapons of the rulers, of the dictators, but a society that over time clamps down on people's freedom to think and to follow their conscience and their mind, that's a dying society and there's no future in that. So that idea seems very, very central to how we can create a global community of people living together. And then I transition, okay, well, let's talk about that. Um, uh, 
we're talking about inherent human value and the necessity of freedom. What does the, the fully developed human being look like? If this is what we want to do here. There, and there aren't many of them. I don't know. What do we, I mean, some <laughs> of these people are. You know, what, what, is, what does that look like? I mean, what's our ideal type, you know? So here I put Mr. Gulen and Socrates and Confucius in a, in a trialogue, the three of them together, because all three of them in a very clear way have these notions about what the best possible scenario is for human beings. And it's people of virtue. It's people of virtue. And, and virtue not only in the moral sense. I mean, there's moral virtue about tr being a truthful person, being an honest person, not murdering. I mean, those moral virtues. But also virtue in the sense of like, like a virtuoso. When someone's a virtuoso on the violin, it, it means that they're an expert, they're excellent. There's a, there's a sense of excellence about them in terms of their knowledge, their skill, uh, they're masters at so many things. And so all three of these thinkers have this notion of this ideal human type that is just a paragon of virtue. So the very next chapter puts those same three people, okay, how do you get these people of virtue? Do they just come down from the angels? Do they just come down from God fully made? No, we give birth to them and we raise them. We have to raise them. So that, theme's, uh, that chapter's theme is education. How, we have to educate them. And Mr. Gulen, if he's known for anything in the world, it's education and the, the type of education that the schools offer. The very last theme is responsibility. And so it, it really fits with these others. Once we go through the progression from inherent human worth to freedom to the ideal human and then to education, the last chapter is on responsibility. How does this all happen? Who's responsible to make this happen, to, to make sure that we're committed to human beings and that we guarantee people's freedoms and that we have this vision of the, of the perfect human in front of us and educate our children? Who's, how does this happen? We take responsibility for that. We, it's on us. And Mr. Gulen is very strong about this. It's very surprising, actually, because many theologians from Islamic or Christian or Jewish perspective might say, well, it's in God's hands. God is ultimately responsible. And which, I mean, God in these, in these understandings is omnipotent and providential and determines things. But as Mr. Gulen points out, God, in his vision, his Islamic understanding, God has made us sort of his deputies, his vicegerents, and we are responsible for the world. And this is a chapter that many people from an Islamic perspective might find difficult because it puts Mr. Gulen in conversation with an atheist, an atheist existentialist, Jean-Paul Sartre. But Sartre, coming from an atheist perspective, is absolutely committed that we are responsible for the world. And there are passages from Gulen and from Sartre. You can read them, and if you didn't know who was writing, you would think it was each other because they're so connected. So that's how I pick these themes. I mean, in my own mind, they're my favorite themes to think about, but in my own mind, they're very connected. And I think that if we can really give ourselves to these themes, we can maybe begin to think about how we can create a, a a culture, a society that works for everyone, for everyone, for everyone, everyone, everyone. Yeah, and it seems so, you and I were talking earlier, it seems so basic. I mean, it's very high level, but, but it, it just should be it's inherent. Basic. But it's hard, it, people are not grasping this in the world today. I mean, we're not, we're not living that way, a lot of people. Every, I mean, all the it's time true. this happens. It's true. I, it's difficult. We live in a culture now, especially in the 21st century, where we are so bombarded um, by things. And I, I'm a gadget junkie as much as anybody, and I watch television, media, and radio, and everything, and love it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be critical of it at all. We just live in a society where we, our attention is so distracted. And these are things that you can't just do, you know, two minutes here, one minute there. I mean, this is when we really are gonna give ourselves to the idea of how do we build a, a community that can peacefully coexist? I mean, how do we do that? We have to sit down and we have to think about it. And we have to talk about it. And we have to glean from the wisdom of the world. The world, the world thinkers and philosophers and writers and artists, they have ideas that are there in the common fund of our knowledge. And, I myself, I mean, this is a little book, it's only 100 pages, I'm just one woman who's written this book, but I, I would like to think that this can make a small contribution to 
let's let's try to begin this kind of conversation. Let's, well, that's let's the begin. start, and that's what you yeah. said. That's another thing. If everybody, you see, okay, yes, you say, oh, that's a small, that's very modest view because it's fabulous and it's it's small but really powerful. Thank you. And if but if everybody did something like that, maybe not a book, but if we all sure this is the attitude. See, if we all get it going that way, and you know, a lot of people say, oh, well, I'm going to throw this piece of trash down because it doesn't matter. Well, everybody well, has that it, attitude, and we're living in a, in a sewer. Exactly. So it got to go the other way. Exactly. Each one of us can do our part in moving in this direction toward creating a culture of peaceful coexistence and really stretching ourselves to find a way to connect to the people next to us in the grocery store, next to us on the subway or the bus, next to us at the office or in school, and, and just pushing through whatever discomfort is there to find that connection. And it, the world will be better off because of it. We will be enriched because of it as people. Peace begets peace. And that, like, yeah. like we were talking about, it really does, once it starts and then other, you'll watch other people do it. It's a very, yeah. it's a very interesting phenomenon because instead, you know, it can go one way or the other, but people tend to be really inherently good. I think so. If you give them a chance, I think people are inherently good. I think Mr. Gulen thinks that. At the same time that we can't be naive about the potential evil that we can do in the world. Destructive, absolutely. That's what I'm, but it's, we're so powerful in the sense of what we can accomplish either way. Yeah. But apathy is not going to get us there. No, apathy won't get us, and being distracted won't get us. It's easy, you know, I, I don't know that, I, I mean, I travel quite a bit internationally, and I don't know that other cultures are this way at all. I can only speak here for the American culture. We're very distracted. You know, we're running around crazy with our hair on fire. You know, uh, working so many hours, running around, listening. We're on the Blackberry. We're on the Blackberry all the, the time. You know, just multitasking and all things. And we're very distracted. And, and the, the bad, the downside of that, I mean, the good side of it is that we can get a lot of things done. The bad side of it is that we are losing maybe that muscle of concentration because there are certain things in life that require sustained attention and sustained concentration. And life will throw you that stuff. You live long enough, life will throw you situations where the distracted model of living won't work. And, uh, and often that's a crisis moment. Uh, so this kind of conversation is something that has us, it, it demands that we just sort of set things aside and really sit down and think about things. And get back to that humanistic yeah. quality. Yeah. You can lose a lot of that with all the distractions and the exactly. gadgets and that there's not a lot of personal, which starts dialogue. That's right. That's right. Sometimes I think we, I, I'll speak for myself. I, I sometimes think I, I am my Blackberry, you know, I am my computer. You, you get so connected to that when really, you know, I can sit here with you and we've only known each other a few moments, but there's a connection. You know, we can feel that human connection. We're sitting here over coffee at a table connecting, you know, in my hometown of Houston this last week, we had a dinner dialogue event where over like 820 people split up into groups of eight and 10 and went to have dinner together in 74 host homes. This happened last night, 74 host homes with total strangers. They went and the whole premise is that if we will just sit down together, we can connect. We can connect. It's possible. Yeah, we can. And we have, it's, it's a great thing to do. We're going to talk more about this. This sure. is very exciting stuff. We are just have to take a quick break right now, but we really do want to hear from you. So please send any comments that you have to footnote at ebru.tv. That's E-B-R-U. And we'll be back after the break with Dr. Jill Carroll. <laughs> 